Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And for this episode, we are going to look at a tragic prophecy. A tragic prophecy, which is a ghost story which weaves in elements of witchcraft and clairvoyance, death omens, and a favourite or certainly a reoccurring topic on this podcast, dogs. And not just any old dogs. These dogs are described as death dogs. Yes, all of this is being crammed into one single story, which I will be talking about on this episode. Now, I've spoken a lot in the past about folklorists and ghost hunters from days gone by who have inspired me, not not just this podcast, but have inspired my work, my books, my articles, and so on. But there is one that we haven't looked at yet, and I think she is particularly interesting because unlike a lot of the others who date back to Victorian times, Edwardian times, if not much older than that, this one is much more up to date, and that is a fellow journalist called Jane Pugh. Now, I don't know a huge amount about Jane's background, besides that she wrote quite extensively about ghosts and witches and warlocks and all these other wonderful things. And many of her books were published in the 1980s. The one I am referring to in this episode dates from 1990. So these are all recent. Well, I say recent. I mean, the 1990s isn't that recent for a lot of people. It makes me feel quite old to think, damn, that was 30 years ago now. But these are not going back to the 19th century old. You know, in, in that sense, they are quite, quite recent. And these are the kind of books that I would have been reading growing up when I when I first sort of got a taste for for Welsh ghost stories and Welsh folklore. And I think what what Jane does really well with these stories and what what lends them really well to a podcast like this is she wrote them almost as if they were works of fiction. They read like fantastical stories. But at the same time, they are all based on fact, on on what people or what people certainly believe to be true. Then we can't say if it was true. And she presents them as if they were short stories. And after digging out this one for this episode, I've been I've been flicking through all my old books by Jane. And I'm thinking, do you know what? I'd, I'd like to make this a regular feature now. So I think every month or so. I am going to be referring back to Jane Pugh, and when I mention her name in the future, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about now. And before we get into this tale, one quite spooky coincidence, and we, you know, we do love spooky coincidences on this podcast, but when I published my first book about ghosts, a book called Ghosts of Wales, Accounts from the Victorian Archives, the introduction starts with, do you believe in ghosts? Because... That is the number one question that I get asked whenever I do any media appearances or interviews. The number one question everyone asks me is, do you believe in ghosts? And weirdly, looking back at the introduction to one of Jane's books, which I've dug out about ghosts, she also mentions in it that, and I quote, often people, especially radio presenters, ask me, do I believe in ghosts? What can I answer? And she tells us that I have seen so many things through the long years for which no explanation can be offered. If I say no, they think I have a cheek to write about them, but say yes, and they doubt my sanity. And I love that answer. And I I also, as I've mentioned before, I also sit on the fence when it comes to answering that question. I, I turn into a politician. I avoid giving a straight yes or no answer. The difference in my case is, <laughs> and I can totally, totally understand where Jane is coming from, where people do say, why, why are you writing about these things if you don't believe in them? And you must be mad if you do believe in them. Well, in, in my case, I think you should keep an open mind about everything in life, not just ghosts, 
religion, politics. If you look at some of the rubbish that is shared on, on social media and things nowadays, I think the world would be a much better place if people stopped to to think about things every now and then. But anyway, that, that's going off on a tangent. and <laughs> This isn't the time or the place for that. Let's get back to the real reason for this episode. And that is the tale of a tragic prophecy. <laughs> and if ever a title to a story deserves a sound effect, a rubbish sound effect, it is a tragic prophecy. Now, while I mentioned that Jane was writing in more recent times, nevertheless, this story does take place in the 19th century. And it begins with the wonderful line, there was a witch, or so she was called. And she lived near Witch's Point by Dunraven Castle. Now, as I mentioned, Jane writes these stories in a way which makes them sound like great little works of fiction, but they are not. They are true, and there really is a place in Wales by Dunraven Castle, which is called Witch's Point. And let's be fair, if you are a witch in 19th century Wales, where better place to live than Witch's Point? Now, Witch's Point is, and this is, I find this slightly weird, but in Welsh, it's known as Troyn Ur Witch. And the, the, the reason I find that a bit odd is the word witch is in there, which, which of course is an English word in Welsh that would be grach, but the rest of it is in Welsh, and that translates as the nose of. So the nose of the witch, although I don't quite understand why it's not troin er grach, but anyway, in Welsh it is supposedly troin er witch. And while both point and nose could, could apply equally. I do like the image that nose conjures up in the mind, because as mentioned, Witch's Point is by Dunraven Castle. Dunraven Castle is right next to Dunraven Bay, a stretch of beach, also known as Southern Down Beach. And on this beach, there is a rocky headland sticking out into the water, sticking out into the ocean's waves, and it does, from a certain angle, look like a witch's nose sticking out into the salty water. And as always, if you wanted to do a quick internet search to have a look at that for yourself, you will all agree with me, I'm sure, it looks just like a witch's nose. Now, this is where our story takes place. Witch's Point by Dunraven Castle in the county of Glamorganshire, Jane tells us nowadays it would be in the, the Vale of Glamorgan, just bordering Bridgend. And it was there that two young men decided to go for a lark, we are told. And this lark involved visiting the witch to have their fortunes told. So this wasn't just one of those witches who hides in the forest like we, we often get in these old tales. This was a more commercially minded witch who was quite happy to welcome visitors take their money and tell their fortunes. Now, these two men, Evor and David, yes, Evor and David, and I I'm going to go off on a very quick tangent quickly, but I imagine Evor is a name that wasn't very well known around the world, outside of Wales, until, bizarrely, and I I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this news story, Rob McElhenney of it's always sunny in Philadelphia fame. And Ryan Reynolds, who is, well, where, where do you start with Ryan Reynolds, the uh, Canadian actor who's been in a, a billion successful films, but as something of a comic book geek, let's focus on Deadpool and, and Green Lantern, say, although <laughs> Green Lantern wasn't the best of films, let's say Deadpool. But when uh, Rob and Ryan, um, if, <laughs> if, if I'm allowed to be on first name terms with them but when they they recently bought a welsh football team they bought wrexham afc which naturally did cause a lot of headlines around the world these these hollywood stars buy in a football team li little known outside of of well the united kingdom really and well I, I really am going off on a tangent but just to wrap this up quickly wrexham's main sponsor the sponsor on the front of their shirt is Evor Williams, Ryan Reynolds, Deadpool himself, made an advert for them, which 
was shared all over social media. And if you care and you pop onto social media, you can find this advert by Ryan Reynolds for Evo Williams. But anyway, back to the story, back to this Evo and back to David. Evo and David were very much split on their opinion on, on these things. One of them, David, was seemingly a believer. David is the one who wanted to go. Evo laughed at him, but went along, you know, as, as a mate, to give him company to go along and see what happened. So the two of them went to the cottage where the witch was living. They knocked on the door and they were called in by the voice that they knew had to be the witch. And to quote Jane, the witch said, Come in. I know you deny my powers. But I will show you how great they are. They entered and were amazed. So this witch, before they'd even walked through the door, she knew there was a, well, at least one doubter among them. It sounds like she thought they were both doubted, but she was certainly on to evil before they even entered the cottage. Now, the cottage was decorated quite sparsely, but as you might imagine one of these cottages to be decorated, it wasn't like a... Hansel and Gretel witch house or anything, although it did have that very distinctive cauldron there, you know, which all good witches had to have at the time. And where it does get a little bit unusual is that there were three cats sat next to three ravens on a windowsill. Now, three cats in and of itself isn't that weird. Three ravens, slightly unusual, but again, maybe, maybe some eccentric people have them. But to have the three cats and the three ravens together, that was a little bit odd, shall we say. Now, she told the two men to sit on a stool each. The stools which had three legs on them. There does seem to be a reoccurrence of the number three in this story already. But the two men, only two of them, not three, but they sat on the three-legged stools. And she drew a circle with a stick on the earthen floor around them. And she said, again to quote Jane, she said, keep listening to my voice, but you must not talk. Instructions to live by there. Listen to the voice, but do not talk. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit gruesome. But she put the cauldron, seemingly half full with water, on the fire, and then dragged a sack into the middle of the room and drew out the carcasses, yes, carcasses of a list of animals. And they were a rat, a hedgehog, a mole, and a skull. She threw all of them into the cauldron and stirred the mixture while it boiled. Now, the skull is, is not specified on. I, I assume human skull, maybe? I mean, you know, a, a hedgehog skull, I imagine, would be quite small. Anyway, these are all thrown into that cauldron, which was half full of water. It's boiling and bubbling away. She chanted a verse as she stirred. We, we are told it was a, inverted commas, a black magic verse. And from that, she gave Evo a glass filled with this liquid from the cauldron, filled with this, this concoction made from what, what we assume to be water, but certainly mixed with the carcasses of dead animals and some kind of skull. And then the witch said, and I, I won't keep repeating this, but whenever I, I quote things that people are saying, th these are, of course, coming from, from Jane's words. But the witch says, look through the glass at the cauldron. What do you see? So he didn't gulp down this concoction, luckily. He merely looked through the glass at the cauldron. He couldn't quite believe it, but he saw, and I quote, my brother in his mate's uniform on the deck of his ship. Now, mate with, with a capital M there, not, in, not as in, you know, my mate's clothing. That's mate as in his rank, first mate in the Navy or wherever he might be serving. And then the witch said, what does he look like? To which he replied, very ill. What is he doing? Clinging to the mast. Now, by this point, Ivor was getting visibly scared. And he was about to get even more scared when the witch said, At midnight tomorrow, at low tide, go 
to the witch's point and stand alone for a quarter of an hour. Do not be afraid, but take no one with you. Come and see me the next day. So it was David who wanted to go and see this witch for a little bit of fortune telling. In the end, it's Eivor who ends up having the, the wits scared out of him and now is faced with quite a dilemma. He thought this was all rubbish and yet he has been given an instruction by the witch to go to Witch's Point on his own at midnight to presumably discover the fate of his brother to see what connection it has with this vision. And so with that, the two friends left and we are told they were very quiet, very unusual for those two, but they were very quiet. They'd clearly been shaken up by this. Ivor, nevertheless, was still defiant. He still argued that he disbelieved it. It was all rubbish and he would go to the point as instructed. And that he did. It was pitch black. It was midnight. And after 15 minutes, he heard what is described as a low moaning. Yes, I'm getting my money's worth with these effects on this episode. But he hears this low moaning and he says to himself, presumably, Oh God, it's the Kahiraith, the death warning. Now, the word Kahiraith does have a few variations and gets used for sometimes just a, a generic word for a spirit or something. But as mentioned by Ivo there, Kahiraith can be a death warning, a death omen, as it's most commonly known as. And with that, it wasn't just the low moaning. He noticed the ocean waves themselves were bubbling, bubbling as if boiling in a giant cauldron. And frankly, that was enough. Evo was out of there. Evo legged it. He was gone. But there was more to come. He realised as he fled the scene in the middle of night, in the dead of night, that he was no longer alone. He was being followed from that spot. And not by anything human. It was a four-legged pursuer. A dark, black Newfoundland. It was a dog. So he called to the dog and regular listeners of this podcast will know what a what a ridiculous thing to do that is we've all heard about the gwithki and i've, I've touched upon the coon anon and e even scooby-doo dogs at one point but we know these dogs are always always bad news you do not call a death omen towards you nevertheless evil called to that black newfoundland and when it came he patted it and tried to get it to follow him home. Evo is clearly someone who has no idea how ghost stories and folklore or any of that stuff works, or, or he just has a death wish. <laughs> Whatever it is, Evo is doing everything that you should never do if you come across a strange, giant, black, supernatural dog that follows you home after midnight, after being on the beach, alone when the water starts bubbling. Now, as it turns out, the dog disappeared, so Eivor did not have to worry about getting some strange, <laughs> supernatural dog out of his house the next day. But he does say to himself that, ah, pity. It would make a grand pet, he thought. Maybe it would. Maybe it would slaughter you at night. We don't know. The dog disappeared. And the next day, he returned to the witch. He told her of that strange wailing. He told her of the bubbling sea. And he told her of the dog that followed him home. To which she said, You have seen one of the death dogs. The Coon Anun. Your brother is dead. That dog he saw was indeed a death omen. But it was not an omen of Evo's death. It was an omen connected to the vision that he had had earlier on his first visit to see the witch. And by visiting that night and by being followed by that dog, it had been confirmed. And a few days later, the news that a tragedy had happened did reach Evo's house. His brother was indeed on a ship at the time. It had been wrecked 
on the Tuscan rocks, and his body was washed up not far from home. We are told it was close to the eastern side of the witch's point. As a result, neither David or Evo visited a witch, a fortune teller, a clairvoyant, anyone who claimed to be able to see the future. Evo was no longer a disbeliever. And that was the tale of a tragic prophecy. And one of the things I do love with stories like that is, believe them or not, that's entirely up to you. But they are set in real places. And I do think it, it's it's my little way of helping to re-enchant the world in a way, if that's not too pretentious a thing to say. But I do love the fact that after listening to that story, you can in theory, jump in your car, drive to Witch's Point, and you can stand in the same spot that Evo stood in and look out at the sea. Maybe not at midnight. Well, you know, that's that's up to you. If you if you want to go to the beach at midnight, please, please don't let me stop you. But it does look slightly better in the daytime. Now, as mentioned, that is one of the many, many stories that was collected by the, the quite prolific and wonderful Jane Pugh. And I do hope to be looking at some of her, her other works, her other stories throughout the year. So, as always, if you have enjoyed this one and you would like to hear more, please consider hitting the subscribe button because that way you will never miss an episode ever. And as always... If you have any thoughts on that story, maybe you are familiar with Witcher's Point. Maybe you've seen bubbling waters there. Maybe you've even tried to convince a stray dog to follow you home from that, that peak on the coast in the Vale of Glamorgan. If so, it's always wonderful to hear from people, even if you just want to say hello. And if you just do an internet search for Mark Race, that's my name, Mark Race. Put the word ghosts or whales or folklore or something in, you will find either my website or you can find me on social media. I'm on all of the main social media platforms. And I think after looking at one of the more recent collections of ghostly stories on this episode, for the next episode, or maybe the week after if I don't mess up my scheduling, but certainly in the next couple of weeks, I think we should go the other direction and look at the oldest collection of ghost stories and they are equally fascinating and equally fantastical but in quite a different way to the more modern day collections but that's all coming up on the ghosts and folklore podcast in the very near future and until then it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening diolch and varian am grando i've been mark Rees. this has been my ghosts and folklore podcast it's the best it's the beautiful. It is the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,